Wait, is this just gate? Chapter 346. Written by Pepper Antique. So tell me of your world young hero. The voice of Crag said as she sat side saddle on Steve's back behind James. Amina had relegated to riding behind Elixon, despite Gorner's protests, and was watching the two of them very carefully. She didn't have too much to worry about though, the voice wasn't exactly close to him, instead she sat several feet behind James and simply kept a hand on the back of his saddle to steady herself. Well. James began with a glance back. It's honestly pretty similar to this one. At least at ground level anyways. He pointed at the rings that dominated the sky, and nodded toward the two moons that had just barely begun to peek over the horizon. We don't have the rings. And only one moon. But if it wasn't for those it would be difficult to tell them apart without taking a really close look. He looked back and was surprised to see that she was actually writing what he said down in a small notebook. He wondered at that. But, it wasn't like he was telling secrets or anything. And up until a few months ago we didn't have any magic either. Though, apparently that's changed. No magic? She asked, her writing having paused. How is that possible? James was tempted to tell her what they'd learned from, not Roiland, last year. Or from Moon and Defiance. But then he remembered that the voice of Crag was a spiritual leader for the Orcs and decided to keep that to himself. He didn't know what kind of impact that might have on another nation's religions. He'd already made that mistake in Vatria, and that had gotten a bit sketchy. Don't uh. Don't know. He said. Amina glanced over at him and he winked at her. She nodded ever so slightly. That's a bit higher than my pay grade. Hum. She said as she began writing again. And how did your people progress without it? She asked after a moment. I've heard tales of you and your fellow Earth Realmers having fantastic technology and weapons. Well. That's the key really. He answered. We focused on technology. That was our path to survival. Interesting. She said in response. And how do you find this world's level of technology? James thought of that for a moment. Nobody had asked him that before. And he had definitely not expected it from the spiritual leader of a nation of orcs. But then again he had to remember that while there were lots of parallels between this world and Earth's idea of fantasy, they definitely had their differences. It's a, it's difficult to compare really. He said. On the one hand, you guys are functionally in what my world's historians would consider the medieval age. You, use swords, and shields, and bows and arrows. You ride on horses and other creatures. There are certain things that don't exist in this world. Yet. And yet there are also certain things that already exist in this world when they didn't during my world's equivalent time period. Like what? She asked curiously as she scooted forward on Steve's back a bit. James looked back uncomfortably. Well. I'm not sure what I can and cannot tell you. He started. But Vatria just unveiled a flying ship. My people didn't get flight until well well after the medieval period. Though a few inventors had ideas. You guys don't have long-distance communication outside of a few very difficult, and somewhat unreliable, spells. You still rely on riders and the post they carry. She was back to scrabbling in her book again. You guys' knowledge of healing is limited to your understanding of magic and basically just, magically reversing damage. Your bodies repel most diseases and sicknesses because of their magical nature. But I was the one that first introduced the mags and healers in the capital to the concept of bacteria and cellular structures. What are those? She asked, a look of confusion in her eyes. Very small things that can't be seen with the naked eye. He said. Which reminds me. I have some questions about how your people survive in the crag. Oh. She wondered. James was about to mention his question about food spoilage when Elixon made an excited noise and kicked his griffin into a long, bounding leap through the air. In his distraction at the conversation, James hadn't noticed how close they'd gotten to the base of the griffin's tooth. Or that there was a rather ornate carriage rolling towards its front gate. Ah. Prince Elixon's betrothed. 
the voice said with smiling eyes as she looked over and passed James. I do so hope that she brought some of her land spiced fruits. Elixir has a betrothed. James asked in confusion. I told you about that a while ago dear. Amina said as she eyed the way the voice was now leaning over him. He himself was looking at her arm, which rested on his shoulder with surprising lightness for her size, in confusion. Ahead of them Elixir opened the door to the carriage and held out his hand to the person inside. He was practically bowed over to talk to them, his massive frame standing almost six inches higher than the carriage itself. A moment later a tall elvish woman, very nearly as tall as the prince himself, stepped out of the carriage. She wore the robes of a mage, but carried two long swords on each hip, for in total. Elixir planted a kiss on her cheek, which she returned in kind, then he lead her over to them as James slid down Steve's side and offered a hand to the voice. A welcome surprise everyone. The prince said. My bride-to-be dash, he motioned to James while looking at her for a moment. Or as James's people would say, fiancé, has arrived earlier than expected. James, Lady Gorna, friend Glag, this is Lady Melody of the Order of the Diaries. He said as he gestured at each of them. My lady this is Captain James Choi of Earth. I've told you a bit about him. Despite her height, and the four swords on her waist, Lady Melody did a sort of curtsy-type greeting that looked almost balletic. It is a pleasure to meet you all. She said in a voice that was higher than James had expected. And good to see you great speaker. She said to the voice. Then she turned to Amina. And princess. It has been too long. Amina smiled and James knew just from seeing it that it was not an actual smile. A.W. Crap. He thought as he watched his wife greet the newcomer. Vickers stood behind five as she picked up and held his modified Colt Tava rifle in hands that moved well enough, but clearly weren't completely accustomed to handling a weapon. Strapped to her face was a monocle made of red, green polarized glass that was easily recognizable as being part of the helmets that he'd handed Dr. Sure. A set of cables ran down from the back of the securing strap to a pack on her belt. That powered it and also acted as a sort of antenna for the communications it was picking up. All right. Sight in on the head of the dummy. He said as he looked over Shaw's shoulder at the tablet he was using to refine the programming of the device. Five lifted the rifle up with only a little awkwardness. Vickers watched as the, almost video game style, aiming reticle on the field moved up and began to waver around on the dumbest torso and head. Hold it steady please. Shaw requested. Vickers glanced back and forth between the tablet and the worst squirrel a few times. Then he walked over and grabbed the former muck marcher's arm with one hand and the butt stock of the rifle with the other. It's too long. Five said with obvious annoyance in her voice. These arms aren't as long as you and the bosses. Vickers pressed the release button on the underside of the stock and pulled three of the extension sections out with audible snaps as the plastic popped off and then reformed. Then he pressed the plate of the stock back in, released the pressure on the button, and slapped it. I know. He said as he released his hold on the rifle. Which was now almost six inches shorter on its back end. Try now. Five pressed the rifle back into the meat of her shoulder again and he saw a bit of a grin as she pressed her cheek up against it. Much better. Shaw said happily. Oh that's not as awkward as I expected. She said with a bit of relief. A hey, your aim's a bit steadier. Vickers said. But you'll also get your nose bloodied if you ride that far up. Huh? She said in confusion. Open your left eye. Vickers said flatly. Should have been open to start. But look at where the charging handle's gonna go and where your bigger squirrel nose is sitting. Five did as she was told, then held the weapon out at arm's length like it had turned into a venomous snake. Relax. That's part of why we're doing this. Vickers reassured her. To figure out what you'll need to do to adapt to our gear. And how to adapt our gear to you. Shaw said with annoyance. Then he pointed out past them. The dummy please. Oh. Sorry. Five said as she reshouldered the rifle again. This time, she kept her nose an inch or so further back and angled up a bit higher. 
Vickers figured that would keep her Schnarr safe so long as she remembered to do that when it came down to fight time. Don't shoot. Driscoll said as he jogged in front of them, weaving between the dummies in a weaving, back and forth, motion that reminded Vickers of old hockey training drills when he'd been a kid. When he got to the opposite end of the dummy field he jumped over the wooden fence there, barely even needing to leap to clear it with his long legs. Stay off the range. Vickers yelled angrily. You're not even loaded. Driscoll yelled as he vaulted over a set of crates near the quartermaster's armory. There was a crashing noise from the other side. Then Vickers saw the red fading to black tufts of his ears pop up. That was already like that. Driscoll said as he began running again, just in time to avoid the grasping arm of the massive orcish quartermaster himself as he burst out of the side of the building yelling at the retreating runner. Vickers would have to remind him of proper range safety later. Maybe by letting five actually shoot at him. After all, it wasn't like any normal bullets would kill the Werfox anymore. Still. He was happy to see the lanky man moving much more gracefully, crash or not. The training was beginning to work. Ah. Uh. Doc Shaw. I think the focus is shifting. Five said, drawing Vickers' focus back to the current issue. No. Dr. Shaw replied. That's your eye shifting. I kind of knew that your new physiology might do that. Quit trying to look straight. You're a damn squirrel now. Your eyes are made more for keeping you aware of your surroundings. Just let your eyes relax. Vickers said. This ain't a sniper rifle. It's an assault rifle with a little reflex on it. All you gotta do is look. If your eye doesn't line up right then we'll send a shopping list to the colonel and try out new layouts until it works. Then he turned back to the doctor. How's it reading the aim at least? Tracking's fine. He said. Then he ran his stylus across one of the settings. How's that? He asked. Five side. It's better than the headache that was giving me. But I'll be aiming at right field if that's how my eye goes now. Trial and error. Vickers said. We'll figure it. Plus it'll work better once we get the second lens online. Shaw said. The other two are working on that now. One step closer. Vickers said with a nod. Then he saw Driscoll coming around again, having already gone all the way around the castle again. Fucking fast. He thought. Once he gets the magic juice flowing through him all the way, he's gonna move like a bat out of hell. He reached into one of the pouches on his vest and pulled out a magazine full of green rubbery bullets. Here. He said as he handed it to Five. When he buzzes the tower this time let's make him shit himself a bit. He said with a grin. Five flinched back at first in an instinctive reaction to his toothy grin. Then she saw the green bullets and grinned herself.